dark save for light being cast from the big tv screen and the imminent sunrise that's teasing the one starry sky with whispers of morning hey george hey lions how's it going you know in uh dragon ball z abridged they they have they set up the contrivance that guru like commits suicide as a way of disabling the dragon balls (laughs) right yeah so the, the noise that he makes is he says, Be a pretty dick move to die right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh that noise, that that's how I'm doing. So uh I didn't tell you any of this in the pre-show, so I could just get like your your live reaction. Um, but the start of my like last week, it's been a couple weeks since we recorded, but like start start of my last week uh was uh one of my friends had several issues that required me to like intervene in the middle of the night so that was Mm. super exhausting like everybody's fine right but like exhausting um my older daughter had her first ever case of strep throat and was like completely (laughs) down for the count and then somehow that wasn't the worst illness because then i had to take my wife to the hospital she's fine (laughs) but like i had to deal with all that so it's been like many days of no sleep and everything and and the the cherry on top of the insanity Sunday was I'm standing in the hospital next to my wife's bed, just trying to, you know, provide emotional support. And my phone rings and it's my dad. And he's like, hey, I just wanted to let you know your grandmother had a fall. She had to go to the hospital, but she's fine. Don't worry. How's everything on your end? And I just went. You know, I'm actually in the middle of something. So, like, I just. I just I'll just have to. I'll call her later and make sure she's okay. <laughs> like, I, I just plopped down in the chair and I was like, all right, life, you win. I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> what do you, what do you got? Yeah. Asteroids, global warming going to happen tomorrow instead of next week. Like what, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> oh, that's the nice thing about global warming is it's all the time. That's true. Yeah. It's not, it's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's been happening. It's done I mean, been happening. So it, every, I just want to stress again, everyone is fine. Like everything turned out, but it was just, so many like little quick hits that uh i seriously considered just being like i need to go sit in a like cool dark (laughs) room for for a day with like like a sensory deprivation tank (laughs) well that is most unfortunate my my last week has been relatively on point there was one big giant meeting that i had on uh on thursday and i was like oh man, this meeting is going to be terrible because it was an all day thing. You know, it was an event and I was leading it. And long story short is that like, it was a situation where theoretically I'm a facilitator. So I'm facilitating this thing they want to do, but they were being forced to do it. So nobody wanted to do it. Oh no. Yeah. And I was just the facilitator, (laughs) you know? So I was like, Hey, we need to hit these goals. And they're like, we don't want to hit those goals. I'm like, technically there's nothing I can do now. You know, Um, (laughs) we have arrived, but I know that the people that are making you do it are going to yell at me if you don't do it. So I was like, this is going to be a stressful mess. But the nice thing is I just took some deep breaths and I went into the meeting and actually it was worse than I thought it was going to be. It was a tragic dumpster fire. (laughs) And, uh, but, (laughs) but I made it through. And the weird thing is, and I, I imagine that you're probably in the same place, is I got home and I just felt like a little weird, you know? And I was like, I don't know what that's about. And then I was, I just went to, to Megan and I said, hey, um, it's like seven o'clock in the afternoon. I'm just going to go lay down for a minute. And I woke <laughs> up at eight o'clock the next morning, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I didn't best. know that. Yeah. I was like, I didn't know that that was low key stressing me out this whole time. And now that my body has apparently been at 10 percent fight or flight mode for the last like week it's like oh we're done finally fighting this gorilla that we've been fighting all week go sleep yeah (laughs) and i did and it was nice yeah i've I've heard i don't know if there's actually good science to back this up but i i do think the like mental model is appropriate where you know people have said oh you're brain doesn't know the difference between like i have a big meeting on thursday and a tiger is about to eat me like your brain just says oh there's stress the difference is the tiger problem is resolved 
usually immediately, right? You mm-hmm. either escape the tiger and you're out of danger, harm's way, or you, you get eaten by the tiger and then it's not a problem anymore, right? Whereas things like, you know, family stress, work stress, like societal existential dread, like those are just, they, they can't really ever be solved fully. Even sometimes like when the event passes, then, you know, you just like drag the, mm-hmm. the emotions with you for ages afterwards. So, uh, I, I don't know if it's a, a actual scientifically supported thing, but I do like the mental model of like, oh, I've been really freaking out about this big work meeting or whatever for a while. Like I need to try to now recover from that, right? Like just like if you then had to sprint away from the tiger and go hide in a cave, you would like stop to catch your breath, right? It's the same kind of thing. It's just harder and more amorphic and American society doesn't really <laughs> praise rest and recovery. <laughs> No, it certainly doesn't, because that's the thing that everybody forgets about Dragon Ball Z, is that the Saiyans only got stronger after they fully recovered from the fight. Right. You know, Which, to be fair, they kept using more and more magical means to foreshorten the recovery time, but the recovery time always happened. Yeah, it was, that was the important bit, you know, like you needed to be, and I remember, man, I would, I would still pay money for those recovery, Frieza recovery chambers, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Wh- which would awesome. you rather have, the recovery chamber or the sensu bean? So, like, that's a very fair question. <laughs> and and I think that it the answer is it depends, right? My life as it stands now, the freeze of recovery chamber, you know? Because, like, it would just be nice to, you know, once in a while take that, you know, two hours and just be alone with my thoughts because it like mentally resets you as well you know but if i was in a situation where i was training for something you know where i needed to get into shape then the sensu being you know yeah that's fair yeah but that's that's my thoughts but we we played some video games thank god (laughs) there was also (laughs) some video games oh my lord um before we talk too much about video games though we are going to do a quick shill uh because you got a shill and Uh, The shill happens at this point in this episode's document. I know because I have an outline thing I'm looking at this time. Thank thank God somebody's keeping us organized. (laughs) Jesus. Um, Mike. Anyway, uh, (laughs) if if you're into I don't I don't even know how to classify that opening. If if anything caught your interest and this is somehow your first episode, welcome. You should subscribe to the show. Uh, If someone recommended you start the show and this is your first episode. That's kind of how they all start now. Um, subscribe, listen more. They're all good. Uh, if you want to go above and beyond, you can leave a rating and review and that's cool. But if you really want to help people find the show, you should send them a specific episode. Maybe this one, uh, usually a game review, because then they'll have a better idea of what the back catalog is going to look like. And it's just an easier way for somebody to get into it instead of reading that generic review on iTunes. Uh, if you want to go super crazy, you can actually support us on patreon and everybody who supports us gets the after show for as little as one dollar uh but at the higher levels you can actually get stuff like stickers and your name Ooh. shouted out on the show and that's cool so for those people we need to first thank our four bit portables keith josh jacob and david our eight bit classics kevin john jason and yarno and our 16 bit hero michael and for one thousand dollars we will do the gallon once more. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you want to know what the gallon is, it's going to cost gotta, you $1,000. It's going to cost you $1,000. Oh, yeah. I told you you weren't going to like this one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, see, I, I, I boy who cried wolf by like pretend not liking a few of them. And now we were <laughs> arrived at one that I'm actually like, I don't know if that's worth $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, uh, I mean, it's, it's two days at least of your, of your life gone, yeah, you know, like yeah. just plus all and, the days it shaves off at the end. Yes. Yeah. But those, that, that's at the end of your yeah. life. And those you suck anyways. <laughs> those are the worst days. <laughs> um, so we have a mailbag question, uh, that I thought was particularly funny for you and I, um, because we worked in a blockbuster together and did. the question is, can you remember the last game you ever rented? Or at least can you remember what era the last game you rented uh, they, when you stopped mm. renting games was um, so we we worked in that blockbuster during the like kind of PS3 Xbox 360 era uh, and I know for sure that that is my like final era because uh, one I'm not counting like the the thing you do with like subscriptions 
and then you download. I was going like, to say, arguably, arguably, yes. I'm renting them now. <laughs> and you feel free to make an argument for that. I don't yeah. think of that that way because I worked in a blockbuster. Like renting means something very specific to me. Um, whereas, like what you do, I would think of as more like I have a Netflix subscription. Um, but I know that that's the last time I rented a game because there was a game on the PS4. It might have been one of the remasters of like an Uncharted game or something, but there was like a big action set game where like I knew I was probably only going to play it once. And I was like, okay, there's a like a red box, whatever the hell the thing is that they mm-hmm. own Gamefly where you can like it's like a soda machine for video games and movies. And I almost rented from it. I came so close. And then at the last minute, I just got this like. I don't have the emotional energy to deal with this if this does not go perfectly like if i get a disc (laughs) out of here and it's covered in scratches or it looks like a toddler or a dog chewed on it like i'm just not going to handle that well because then instead of spending my precious free time playing the game i'll be spending my precious free time trying to get a refund from the company so that i can rent another copy of the game and i'm just like no I can't do it. I just can't do it. I will either buy it. I will wait till it's on sale. I will do something else, but I'm not going to put money into this soda machine and get a game out. Right. Maybe if it had been like a blockbuster where I could have stood there and opened the case and looked at the, the Blu-ray and made sure it was okay. But I just, you can't argue with a soda machine. So I was not, <laughs> I was not willing to have a one-sided customer service interaction with this video game robot. So uh definitely ps3 era i wish i could remember exactly what game it was but it was definitely the ps3 era and from the store we worked at yeah I, you know i honestly think that um if i had to guess i would probably say ps2 era and the reason why outside of again making the argument that i i rent games now you know which again i i really enjoy because but i i will i would agree with you that it is somewhat fundamentally different because there's no time limit to the rental you know so like it's not like, oh, I rented this thing and I've got a week to play it. So I now need to make life changes, you know? Oh my God. Sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know what I just realized? Mm-hmm. I was going to say, oh, ha ha. It's like you are preemptively paying late fees. But no, that's literally what you're doing. That's what a subscri- <laughs> That's what a subscription is. Is like instead of going in, paying a one time fee and then risking late fees, you just agree to pay late fees forever. And, <laughs> and then you have access to the subscription forever. Yeah, I mean, kind of, you know, is, is that they say, you know, it, it's the, uh, oh, what was it, the the movie pass? Movie pass. Right? Yeah. yeah, movie pass. It, it's that where it's just like, hey, man, give us this much money and you have as much as much as you want forever. All of the things forever. Um, but, but this is, but, uh, was it World of Warcraft where they changed, you get an experience penalty for mm-hmm. overplaying to you get an experience buff for playing mm-hmm. less? This, this is literally that. They took the idea of late fees and said, what if we just make them sound like a positive thing instead of a punitive thing? Right. I think that the other difference is that you can rent as many games as you want, right? Yes. Yeah. But unlimited library access. Yeah. That being said, though, is that and and again, I don't know all of the technology about behind it, but ostensibly it's a much better business model because it's it's um, uh, planned revenue. Right. You know, where it's like, hey, I get. You know, they're going to pay me $60 a year. This is pretty much what my annual subscription revenue is going to be, you know, as opposed to a blockbuster where it's like you could have good months or bad months. And, you know, sometimes the months were great and you got to have, you know, seven drinks at the bar right next to the blockbuster before you came sauntering in to (laughs) badger your employees. And some of them were lean months where you could only have three drinks at the bar before you came in at (laughs) 11 o'clock to badger your employees. Not that either of us would have known anything about that no i i can't imagine a regional director behaving in such a manner certainly not toward <laughs> his two star employees exactly who could close that thing in four minutes <laughs> <laughs> anyways um i i actually think that i'm probably a generation before you because he, here's the thing is that i always tended to not rent games i tended to buy them you know um either at gamestop or what have you most of the time, though, because and, and I think that this, again, kind of addresses the different ways that we approach video games, which is that I am, you know, I'll play a game for 15 minutes and throw it away forever. I don't care. Right. But if I play a game, I'll play it for years. You know, like I'll I mean, civilizations. I'm still playing Civilization six. I just played a game of Civilization six like this week, you know, because I was just <laughs> like, hey, man, you know, I could just I, I just need a little bit of this. Right. Um, I say that to say that. Because of that, you rented the video games, 
and I would play them. And then if I got past the 15 minute mark, I would then go buy them, you know? So like, I think that the last time it said George, George Witt rented this game on the receipt was probably right about the time I met you was the last <laughs> time I rented a video game. Now they'll be all his expenses. <laughs> and so, but I mean, you know, cause I remember the way that we bonded, you're the one friend I have that I didn't bond with through D and D specifically. We bonded through Dragon Ball Z Budokai three. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, yeah, we did. And that's how we became friends. Uh, and so then after that though, whenever we would, you'd be like, Oh, Hey, I, I saw this new game. I want to try this. I want, and I would just be along for the ride, you know? So like you were kind of the leader of, I want to try this thing. And I'd be like, yeah, man, I'm in for that, you know? And then if I was like, Ooh, this is really good. Then I would just go buy it and also play it. Which I think is again, much like your, this, I don't owe this game. Anything attitude towards your backlog is like <laughs> not not going into basically anything with unnecessarily pumped up expectations is good. And it seems like it's so uncommon in like entertainment discourse, but like movies right now because of cinematic universes and, and video games for quite a while, it's like tears of the kingdom came out a few weeks ago as of this recording. And a few people that I follow online, like it's like, Oh, this is your entire personality now. Like you, yep. I mean, and the thing is, like, I I find it a little, it's just annoying to just see people talking nonstop about one and only one thing, especially before it's even released, and they have no idea if it's even any good. But then right. after it came out, I actually found the gushing to be more interesting because they were all gushing about different things, right? Like, mm. oh, my experience is like this, and my experience is like that, and I'm I'm doing this, and I'm focusing on that over there. And it's like, oh, okay, so now I feel like they're telling stories as opposed to all just jumping up and down like waiting for the boy band to take the stage and it's like oh my god i love them and it's like they have not started playing <laughs> right <laughs> so i i just i i'm you are still a role model for like how how important <laughs> these things actually are in our lives and like we can enjoy them but maybe don't make it your entire personality <laughs> Oh, thank you I, I i appreciate that actually megan said something um to me the other day where i was like that is very high praise and i i will take it because I, I like i like when people say nice things about me but i was like i've got to let that one not go to my head which is <laughs> i said i said we were talking about this and i said yeah you know basically like video games are entertainment so i enjoy it while i am playing it and then i don't think about it when i'm not playing it you know like i don't think about like what am i gonna play next or anything like that like i just sit down and play it and she said is that is that like nirvana like isn't that what you look for is to like be perfectly in the moment and i was like i want to say yes but like <laughs> i feel like saying yes means that i'm not there i don't know i don't know how to deal with that but i was like thank you so much for the compliment you know? yes i i am perfect as you just on your own unprompted yes. brought up yes correct <laughs> as as you have said i am much like the buddha and <laughs> <laughs> who was and i'm pretty sure i'm quoting directly from uh his scriptures here kick ass at call of yes. duty <laughs> <laughs> have you seen uh um uh legend of ragnarok on uh netflix don't know that one uh so basically it's it is a anime that is amazing in principle and in my opinion terrible in execution oh, no. but the idea is is that it's you know the gods have decided we're done with people right and so we're gonna kill them all but it's a tournament but the tournament is the best humans throughout history versus all the gods greek gods you know all of them right like the the greek gods uh the you know like uh adam like christian gods like all of it you know like mm. it's just all in there i'm like that's kind of a cool concept you know battle royale between any cool people so like the first one was i think like lu boo versus somebody and the other one was like adam versus somebody you know like stuff like that right poseidon versus uh um uh, a, a, an ancient samurai what <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> and, and the problem is that it's 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 20 minutes of them talking about their backstory and then like one minute of fighting but i found it tolerable if i fast forward you know as i'm going through netflix so i probably watched like 10 hours of content in about two um i say all of that to say that uh yeah the buddha is in there you know um but he it's it's siddhartha right you know so like uh but yeah when you said like the buddha is kick ass and i'm like he is actually in <laughs> in that one he's he's uh he's pretty cool <laughs> what does he have a 
specific style you recognized? Uh, so the the season two ends with him entering the ring, ah. and the big big reveal is so he's he's a god, right? But he enters the ring and he's like, "I'm fighting for humans," you know. Ah, and yes. so that's kind of his thing is that he's kind of kind of a rogue. Um, he he's always kind of sucking on like a a lollipop kind of a thing. So I was like, maybe that's supposed to be representative of his like take pleasure in simple joys that happen now, or I'm overthinking it. And some artist said this will be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah tell me if, if you find out if it's a vinegar lollipop because that would be a deep mm. cut yeah but anyways what are you playing and why should i care uh so i mentioned before that uh, i got a steam deck and i will have more to say about that um but the immediate benefit was exactly what i was hoping it would be right even with the last uh week being a complete crap show and the week before that like having normal work stuff and you know family and life stuff to deal with it allowed me to slot video games into parts of my life where I was not at a TV with a console or at my PC, right? Which is exactly what I was hoping for. So we're off to a bang and start. But um, I played, uh, we we picked for the next episode of Nostalgia Goggles, uh, we're going to be playing Mega Man 2. And I was just mm-hmm. like, I I want to make sure this is the one I'm thinking that it is. Because they all, the first six all kind of like rub together because they all use yeah. the same engine and everything. And uh I sat down and I was like, yeah, okay, this is it. And then it was like, uh, what? And I had finished it, right? I just like, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't like turn once the game started and I heard that familiar music and I thought about like the Wiley's Castle music and I saw the select screen with familiar robot masters. I was just like, oh my God. So uh, I'm going to have to play through that a couple more times before we record for that episode since I just like devoured it. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, more Final Fantasy 14 forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, I also, uh, played for maybe like an hour uh celeste classic so like the what is that so that game uh was originally made for the pico 8 fantasy console um Mm. part of the reason the game you know looks the way it does is because the pico 8 is like so hyper restricted it's it's more powerful than a nintendo in certain ways and then more restricted than a nintendo in other ways so it's kind of like a weird like nintendo slash game boy in in its restrictions um and and so celeste classic is exactly what you would imagine but just on a way smaller scale right so single screen puzzles uh there's not a grand story the puzzles themselves are a little bit simpler um it's but it's it's celeste like you can absolutely see it and feel it in the gameplay It's, it's actually pretty impressive how polished it is uh i also started a game called i think it's pronounced picon tier p-i-c-o-n-t-i-e-r uh it which purports to be like a harvest moon stardew valley it's a life sim right like Mm -hmm. oh you're on a farm and you gotta go do some farming the thing that makes me want to play it more slash terrified to play it more is Mm -hmm. the opening scene of the game and and i'm not going to leave any details out like this is the entire opening scene you land on this island and there's you and there's a, a scientist and the scientist is like, ha ha, I knew it. This island is rich in like Pico matter, like this magical, you know, metal or whatever. And it's like, you know, we can definitely do our research here. And then it smash cuts through a black screen. And it's like a few years later and you're in his lab and he's like, okay, I'm going to turn the machine on. So just to be safe, go back to the house and go into the basement, you know, just like we've done every other time we turn the machine on. Ha uh-huh. see you soon and then it cuts to you in the basement and uh there's like a little locked door and there's a ladder when you get near the ladder a robot pops out of the ground like a monolith like like a big gray with a face in the middle and he's like hey you know i named myself lions right so he's like hey lions it feels like it's been a little while since we talked according to my records it's been 259,000 days and I was Jeez. just like, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you go upstairs and there's a town, like a charming little harvest moon town with charming little harvest moon people. And you go and you talk to them and they all say some version of the same thing, which is like a normal thing. Like, you know, Oh, good weather today. And then a denial that a huge amount of time has passed thing. Like, you know, oh, I was surprised to see how dusty the China was this morning when I was getting breakfast. 
And just like everyone around town is like trying to go about their normal lives, but also seems vaguely aware that something has happened. <laughs> but then, then all of that stops. And I played for like two or three more hours. And all you do is normal life sim stuff. You have to learn how the watering can works and how you get seeds and where you go to fight monsters and how you can like craft stuff for your house. And I was just like, what? What was that opening? What is happening? <laughs> so that was weird. Um, and I also uh, you think there's a payoff to that. I this is exactly why I want to play it, but I'm afraid to play it because what if there isn't like that would be infuriating. It'd be yes. so infuriating. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, like, that's, you really have to trust the developer that you're, they're going to pay that off, you know? Yeah, and and the thing that actually has me leaning toward maybe not continuing to play it is, um, you remember, like, when we played Harvest Moon, like, you gotta walk up to, like, the vegetables and pick them out of the ground, and you gotta walk up to the, the rocks and, like, hit them with the pickaxe, and this game, like, every life sim game has those same mechanics, the collision targets, like, mm where you have to be in relation to a thing to pick it up is so specific that a lot of my playtime was just like making these little micro adjustments to get the right distance from the thing or to be on like the right you know x and y axis from the thing and that i kind of think is unforgivable like the game isn't brand new right like they could have been tweaking that and making those collision targets bigger for years right the game's been out for at least a couple of years so that if if something makes me not play it it's that interaction being clunky and terrible not because i'm overly terrified about them not paying the story off uh the the one other game that i've been putting some time into is uh i think we talked about ages ago vampire survivors which is a the it's an idle game so you you play the entire game with just the thumbstick um or mm. a mouse i guess if you're playing on on keyboard um and you Basically, what you are trying to do is not die. So there's just endless hordes of enemies. And as you kill them, they drop crystals. You get crystals. You gain experience. When you gain a level, then you get like a random improvement from a list of improvements that you could pick from. So it's a a rogue light kind of thing because there's some permanent unlocks. But then there's, you know, how a run goes is really luck based. And uh, I played it when it was new and i was like okay i, I kind of get this and then the more time i spent with it i actually found myself really enjoying picking apart the little systems of like okay if i can get these three uh upgrades then those are like pretty powerful together but if i try to do this other like stack of upgrades if i don't get the middle one i'm really screwed like i have to get like one two three in that order otherwise their you know synergies don't have super saiyan effects right so there's it's just very simple like the systems aren't super complicated so you can just sort of passively be like you know oh yeah i got the garlic or oh yeah i got the this, you know the knife power up that i like or oh no i got the one that sucks and i don't like right so it's it's kind of got that gungeon like what's in the chest mm. sort of vibe yep. um which is fun because the since you literally all you can do is control your direction on the screen all of the weapons fire automatically on a cooldown timer so it's really low like effort in your dexterity but you do have to kind of think about like okay how am i going to chain my upgrades together how am i going to strategically route around the screen so that i can like circle back to pick up all the Mm. experience crystals it's actually a decently fun little game and has weirdly spawned like an entire copycat genre it's exhausting to already (laughs) hear people talking about vampire survivors likes um but but anyway it's funky it is fun and uh in the original version of the game it is it's so it's not it's not good in the in the original version of the game they uh they had a 30 minute time limit so when you hit 30 minutes as a way to like force you to reset the run um death like all the monsters Mm -hmm. die and then death comes flying in at a million miles an hour just instantly kills you and i had my first 30 minute run the other day where i actually captured i'll uh i'll I'll post it into the show notes which you can find i didn't say this at the top at nogog.show uh there short url um I'll uh I'll I'll put the the little video in there because once you have like 20 or 30 upgrades the amount of noise on the screen is bananas like just mm. visual absolute visual nonsense and uh now like you can play like an endless mode where you can I guess go beyond 30 minutes or you can defeat mm. death if you have certain upgrades or something but part of me was just like no this is a good place <laughs> to stop this 
not because it's too visually noisy, but because the systems are now interacting in such complicated ways that you don't feel like you're making real decisions anymore. Either mm. your early decisions have paid off and you're invincible or your early decisions did not pay off and nothing you can do at this point will matter because the monsters are so strong. So having right. a maximum run length, I actually think is kind of a cool design choice for a roguelite. I don't, I don't know how common that is, but I, I sort of like it. No, I agree. Cause I, actually that's something that, uh, uh, and this, this dovetails nicely into my stuff. Um, so, uh, it, with, with D and D, you know, we're like, Back back in three five, they had the epic levels handbook where you could get all the way up to level forty, sixty, and I don't know, forever, right? Yeah, super went, high. Went super high, right? Um, but you know, D and D fifth edition was like level twenty. That's it. That's as high as you go, you know. And so, and like you said, by that point, you've either created a character that's invincible between your items and buffs and all sorts of stuff, or you created a mediocre uh, character, or you've created a garbage character that can't survive anything, right? You know, but it's like. No, level 20. That's what, and, and the same thing with like ability scores. Ability scores used to be able to go up as high as possible. Now it's like, no, it can only go up to 20, 24 in some extreme cases. Gods have a 30 strength. So, you know, that's what we're doing. So I, I kind of like that, you know, upper upper threshold. Uh, one other quick note. In your notes, um, you forgot to put a comma between Celeste Classic and Vampire Survivors. No, the game and that I, was, I played was Celeste Classic colon vampire survivors and i was interested for that one <laughs> <I won. laughs> that's why you said i've been playing celeste classic i was like yeah tell me more about that and i was like this doesn't i don't know man where are the vampires at and then you said the next thing i was like oh okay there's there needs to be a comma there it does a lot of heavy lifting <laughs> punctuation matters <laughs> um what have i been playing so uh two two things one is i've been uh, playing i've not been playing a lot of dnd i have been writing a lot of dnd in in preparation for your visit to me i have been making a whole a whole city and i am five districts out of 10 districts down which means that i gotta start making new life choices in order to get those other five districts made <laughs> or just be okay with some of them being under construction when you get here um I say all that to say that I am just enjoying writing the mess out of that man because like it's just differences in kind, you know. Um every time I'm like, oh, okay, so here's like kind of a fun adventure thread, but how could I make it more interesting? For example, one of them that I came up with just the other day that I'm I'm really excited about is uh and, and again, you, you you may never find it, right? But is that uh is that, you know, there's a person at a college and they need you to be a research assistant, right? And so and so the the way that I'm setting this up is, uh, you know, uh, you have seven days to do things, right? So um, you can spend up to seven days, up to the whole week, just working on this one mission by re preparing yourself by going to the library and reading up. But the thing is that as you assist her, if too many people screw up the experiment, the experiment goes sideways, right? But that's all up to you. You know, do you want to spend five days at the library researching and buffing out your ability to help? Or do you just want to shoot from the hip and see how it goes you know so i'm just i'm really enjoying all that the reason why i mention it is because um uh my son uh I, he and i were playing pokemon uh card game right mm -hmm. and so i said hey i've got to go do another thing and i came back and he, th there's energy everywhere right <laughs> too much energy you know i'm like i'm like there's, unless you've been playing this for longer than i know you've been playing it it's impossible for you to have that much energy out so that looks like a lot of energy dude and he goes Oh, yeah, you know, like, because he's playing with Invisible Teddy, you know? Um, and he goes, yeah, I, I, I changed the rules a little bit when I'm playing with Invisible Teddy. I'm like, dude, you got to play by the rules. And then I took a step back and realized that I'm clutching all of the D&D &D rules to make this new game that I want to play with you guys. I'm like, I think I might be the problem here, actually. <laughs> Teddy, <laughs> where did you learn this behavior? From you, Dad. I learned <laughs> it from watching you. <laughs> exactly. So, uh... So I learned I learned something because when, when Megan mentioned that, I was like, yeah, I think that's probably me. And the funny thing is I said, like, because I have a tendency to make up my own rules and I started to link it to the D&D &D thing. And she said, oh, like that card game you made? I was like, that's yes, that too. <laughs> also that one. <laughs> <laughs> like this is uh, becoming increasingly damning that this is my fault. Well, um, yes, but there there's the like the the progress arc, right? Like. If you are going to become a jazz musician, you don't start with jazz. You start with like four, four regular like quarter notes on the beat only, right? No unusual rhythms. 
you have to learn scales and stuff. And then you learn how to break all those rules, when to break them, when not to break them. But uh, none of that matters to a child. So (laughs) (laughs) they don't, they're just like, I like jazz. I want to play jazz. Well, and also too, like he's definitely still in the the phase of his journey of the numbers going higher is awesome, right? You know, so at one point he was breaking the rules of the game. He's like, look, I got all of these items and now I have a plus 10 to attack when normally you have like a plus two, you know? It's like, isn't that awesome? I'm like, yes, this is the ma- This is the extreme of the game. This is as far as the game can be pushed. Nothing can touch you. You are invincible. You play it, but yeah, you, you did it. no stakes, you yeah. know, like. Um, when I, I had a, uh, a similar experience where I was at the like a local community basketball court with my seven year old and the hoop was lower for like children, but like older children. And so she couldn't take like a normal shot. So I was like, okay, stand here, like, you know, do it underhand like this. And then she like kept, it was just flying wild. And I was like, oh, you, you don't know, like you need to aim at that square, like see the square on the back. You're not trying to get it into the bucket. You're trying to hit the square and then it will bounce off the square into the bucket. And she sometimes gets frustrated with stuff and then just doesn't want to do it. Right. She gets embarrassed like a lot of little kids do, but man, for whatever reason, she stuck with that for about 10 minutes. And when she finally sank a basket, I feel like is the happiest she's ever been. And I was like, <laughs> right. If I had like picked her up on my shoulder and like, let her do like an easy layup, she would have been like, yeah, I made one and then forgotten about it forever. But for like two days, she talked about sinking that bucket on her own because she did. And, and I had, you know, a similar moment to like what you were talking about uh, in the beginning of the show, which is like, I'm a good parent. I'm good. I did the right thing. <laughs> I am a great parent and everyone should praise me. <laughs> well, and one thing I think that is both of our parenting styles and a little bit different than our, our parents' parenting style in general is that um, when Teddy wants to beat me at something, he can he can beat me, you know, like I, I'm not saying that like 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 he can try, you know, like I'm not. I'm not going to dumb dumb it down. I'm not going to play not as hard. I'm not going to do any of that. He can beat me when he beats me, you know? So, like, we were playing Trouble the other day, and uh, and I handily beat him twice. And he's like, oh, man, Dad, you're so lucky. And I'm like, luck has nothing to do with it, buddy. It's strategy. And he was like, strategy? I'm like, yeah, look at what I'm doing. And I explained it to him, and he was like, I think I get it. And then it was funny because I got a text from my wife the next day where he goes, Teddy is destroying me in trouble. <laughs> And I was like, is he using my strategy? She's like, I think he is. And I'm like, yeah. You know? uh, uh, yes, the wit maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, no, no, no. You got to keep these pieces back. These are your strikers. And then you got to keep these. These are your forwards. And I was just like making up names for it, you know? Yeah. And, and <laughs> I'm imagining like years from now, him across from uh, the table from somebody and then being like, ah, the wit opening. I see this isn't the first <laughs> time you've ever been in trouble. <laughs> And it just like the 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 borderlands like smash you know to like <laughs> yeah, the, the action, action bars. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other game I've been playing at your recommendation has been Star Trek Resurgence, and uh, one of the things I kind of mentioned at the the beginning of the show to you is uh, really uh, so far I'm enjoying the game. Um, terrible polish, just the worst, you know, like. Like and and especially because the most of the story is about your interpersonal interactions, like having that lack of polish, I'm really glad that you recommended it to me because I would have dropped it like it's hot in the first fifteen minutes and said, This game is trash. Nobody cares, right? Um it is way more though, it, it it's it when I before I bought it, is it I looked at the recommendations and it said other games you might like would be Tell Tales the Borderlands and stuff like that. You know, I was like, Okay, no, that that's helpful. I know what I'm getting into. Um and so uh, there were two two things that happened in the game where I was like, I, no, they get it. I'm into this. All right, let's let, we're cool. Let's do this, which is that every time you they'll give you three choices of like stuff you can say. Right. And I promised myself as I'm like, I'm going to play this first playthrough as me. Like I what would I, George, the commander and I, George, the petty officer do. Right. You know, so and there were some times where I was like, I think the game wants me to say this, but that's not what I would do. Um <laughs> So at one point I'm sitting down with uh with with Spock, right? And um so sorry, every time you do something that the people like, their icon their face shows up and it just a little green, right? You know, say uh, like hey you, you don't get it, the fallout everyone liked that. Right. No, you get like their <laughs> kind of you get their picture and it turns green or a picture and it turns 
white means it did not impact them at all, right? Like it didn't positively or negatively, right? Like they made note of it, right? And then uh, red is you upset them, right? And most of my decisions were mostly green, right? And I was like, that's because I'm a good commander, you know? Like I know how to win friends, influence people. And then uh, Ambassador Spock showed up on the ship, right? And so you're the commander. You're, you're the second in command. You're not the captain, right? So I'm in the meeting with my boss, right? The captain and all of the bridge crew and Spock. And he's like just laying on like, here's, here's everything that's going down, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, here's what I think about it. You know, like I was given three options. And I picked the one. I'm like, this is what I would say. And Spock showed up and it was white. And I was like, all right. All right. No, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe he wanted, because I was like, it's between these two, but, but this one, he wanted the other one. Okay. That's fine. And then, you know, another, another thing to say. And I said another thing and Spock showed up as white and I was like, <sighs> and so I actually, you can open up a menu and see exactly what they think of you. And said, Spock noted this and, I, and I, Spock noted that. And I said, that, Falcon is never going to like me. You know what? Because he's an emotionless, an emotionless turd and, <laughs> and he has no feelings. <laughs> this is his but fault. I appre- <laughs> but I appreciated that because he doesn't like or dislike me because he's Vulcan. He's right. just making note of my capabilities. And I'm like, I like that. I had the emotional reaction they wanted me to have, which is, how do I get you to like me, Spock? Yeah, yeah. A human interacting with Vulcan would be very frustrating. Yeah, yeah because it's like, can you at least are we are we on the same page? Are we cool? It's like I have no idea why we would need to be cool or uncool. I simply am noting your ability to do your job. You seem to be able to do it, so we're cool then, right? Again, it's like <laughs> <laughs> so that was a weird like enjoyable moment to where i was like no 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 this is cool um one of the other ones where i so <laughs> apparently i'm not a great second in command because i pissed off the captain um basically a a, a thing he puts you in command of the ship because he has to you're at a star base right so he goes on the star base to go get a person so you're in command right and things go sideways right and so basically they're like Protocol is to do thing A, but there are mitigating circumstances and a secondary option, right? So the captain gets on the horn with you. Oh, mild spoilers for the first 15 minutes of this game. Uh, Captain gets on the horn with you and says, disengage the docking clamps, right? And um, and then they're like, but but captain, if we do this super scientific thing, you know, it could also work. And I said, do the scientific thing. And the reason why is in my mind is I was like, he doesn't have all of the information. He's giving me an order to do a thing, but he, he's not here. He doesn't have all the information to make the correct decision. So I'm going to make the correct decision. That's what he pays me for. Right. And so I did that and all of the crew lit up in green and he lit up in red. <laughs> and I was like, uh oh, he's he's a mad. And so <laughs> it ends up being the correct decision. Like I did, like nobody died. Everybody comes back unharmed. Right. And so, uh, so he, he, he comes back onto the bridge and he's like, report. And they're like, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, mm-hmm. commander in my ready room. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> oh. Does everybody on the bridge go, ooh, ooh you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I get pulled into his ready room and, uh, and he says, uh, you know, you directly disobeyed my command. And the thing that I was really happy about is I was given three options of things to say. And one of them was you didn't have all of the information that you needed to make a good decision. That's and I was good. like, yeah, that's good. That is why. Right. And I was like, yeah, good. And so I selected that one and it was just lit him up and read again. He did not <laughs> like that. <laughs> and so when I, I, I hit the pause screen and selected this thing, it said he was upset about your insubordination with his direct order and your continued insubordination. <laughs> And I was like, no, I stand by the decision. I feel like I made the right call. And so then as we're talking back and forth, he says, like, my reputation already took a hit with this other thing. And now with you not with you not obeying my orders, word's going to get around. I'm like, ah. And so now we're getting to the real reason why you're upset with me. And one of the options that I had that also upset him that because I didn't pick it was, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And I didn't pick that because I'm not sorry. I feel like I made the right call. And so... I'm getting along with a lot of people on the ship, not the captain, but I feel like I'm making the right decisions, you know? And, and so it felt like a management problem, like a good Star Trek game should be, where it's like, make an interesting decision, you know? And I was like, yeah, this is good. So 
I really hope they remaster the game because the polish is absolutely <laughs> terrible, but it's fun otherwise. Well, you have me curious now because I forgot that it was a Telltale game. Mm. And this kind of game, like this is, I think literally all they do is they yep. make narrative driven character interaction story games set in other people's universes, right? Like they, they are incredible chefs but they have no access to raw ingredients. So they like go and they're like, Hey, I see you have some chicken and this other person has some carrots and I'm going to put those together into the most delicious dish you've ever had. But like somehow they don't have like, as far as I know, any of their own properties or at least none of the games they're famous for are their own properties. Right. And uh, what that makes me curious about is I wonder if what you are perceiving as a, cause I haven't, I haven't played the game. Right. And I've right. actually only played one of their games and it was years ago, but I wonder if what you're perceiving as a lack of polish is the like weird sort of animated kind of like art style that they do because all of the clips of their games that I've ever seen all have a similar animated kind of it's a little blocky almost like they're going for more of an art house look than no, it's not no, that. No, it's not. It's not. It's not that. Because I, I, I know, like, if, if you're comparing it to the tale, te- Telltale's The Walking Dead, right? Yeah, and they did Back yeah. to the Future, which was very cartoony, even though those are real people, right? No, no. This this looks like it looks like they took stock Unreal Engine animations and threw on there. You know, like they oh, that they look like that's, real that's people. Too bad. Yeah, yeah. Like I would have preferred it to have like you know that art house feel. Because that that I would have, it, it, but they really got the facial emotions right, you know, as opposed to, you know, it, it looks like a Call of Duty, you know, it doesn't look like Borderlands, it looks like Call of Duty, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, you know, it's not to the point where you, you just kind of have to acknowledge it and then say, I am going to ignore this, you know, because, yeah, there are tons of times when, you know, at one point you're walking into an area and you're hurt and I'm like, that looks awful, but don't think <laughs> about that. Just think that person's hurt, you know, like that's, you know, so don't, don't let it pull you out of the moment, you know, kind of a thing. So yeah. Yeah, this is a uh, God. I don't remember the last time I made like a targeted recommendation to you. I was like, you specifically, you should play <laughs> this specific game. Right. Cause I know I've said stuff like, Oh yeah, you, you might like this. or this does some interesting things, but yeah, I uh, the 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 one article that I sent you, I think it was Polygon, maybe whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, that I was reading through that, and they just kept drilling on like a Star Trek game that understands what Star Trek is actually about, and I was like, <laughs> that could be like a that statement could mean so many things, but because I am one of the kinds of jerks who says that, I know what someone probably means when they say that. Right? It's it's not voyager it's not enterprise it's not um uh discovery right it's the tng like i was the right age at this time in history and you know oh captain my captain that's what star (laughs) trek is even though there is now more not tng than tng by like two or three fold but for us and for people i think like us like that is correct star trek and everything else is attempting to emulate it which I feel bad about because like a lot of the newer stuff is not attempting to emulate that, but I am still holding it to that standard. Well, I think that that to me, Star Trek TNG is if you say which, which is the best science fiction Star Trek, it's TNG, you know, then other Star Treks do other things and scratch other itches, you know, but if you, you, cause like I love deep space nine, it's the West wing in space, you know, it's, it's fun if that's what what you're in into, you know. And it does do some sciencey fi- sciencey fictiony stuff, you know. Um, Voyager is its own thing, uh, and, and and as they've gone on, it's it's less science fiction and more science fantasy. Now it's 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 uh, Grand Theft Auto in space, or uh, you know, <laughs> the Fast and the Furious in space, right? You know, the Fast and the Furious and did go to space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, <God>. um, and so. <laughs> And so that's fine if that's what you're looking for. If you, you you know, like if you want to see this amazing thing where, you know, the Enterprise like pulls up through a nebula and it's like, dun, 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 dun. Like that feels amazing and it's awesome, but it's not science fiction. It's just, it's just action movie. And, and that's okay. But if I'm, if I'm looking to scratch the itch of, and, and that's why every single time Teddy says, 
why don't we watch some Star Trek? I'm like, yeah, let's watch some Star Trek, you know? And I pick like one of the ones that I liked as a kid, you know? We just did the one recently where the uh, Enterprise is becoming, is developing emergent sentience, you know? It's, it's a good episode. Talks about emergence, talks about, you know, like, like, well, and because at one point they're like, shut it all down. And Picard's like, this is a life form now, right? Like, should we do that? And I'll, I'll pause and be like, what do you think, Teddy? He goes like, I don't know, man. It's like, but you're thinking about it. And that's the important bit. Yeah. Well, and good that he didn't immediately jump to either answer, right? Yeah. No, it's definitely a life form. And no, it's definitely not a life form. It's like, well, you should probably side with the risk of a life form, right? Because like, that's where the higher risk is. So you would want to lean that way. But it's good that you didn't just jump to like a gut response because that's also not good. Right. And that's the thing is, it's like, okay, well, because and, and the thing that they do such a great job setting it up, and this is where I think that this game will um, shine, I'm hoping, is it's like, okay, so the decision is it's like, okay, decision A, terminate it, right? In which case, yeah, you might be killing something new and unique in the universe, right? And as I believe Picard says, is their job is to seek out new life and new civilizations, and this is it. You know, like this is this is potentially a new life form, right? But it is putting the ship at risk, which means that you are risking the lives of 1,000 actual life forms that you know for sure is a life form yeah. in order to potentially save this emergent life form. Now, the risk is low, but it's non-zero. So it's just like juggle all of that, you know? And, and, and again, like that's the thing is that like there is the decision that Picard and the crew make, but there's not necessarily a definitive right decision. And that to me is where Star Trek is where it's like you know we're good science fiction is where they say here's a question all right here's what we're gonna do but what would you do and you're like I, I i don't i don't know let me let me think on it you know yeah anyway so uh so it seems to be scratching that same itch so far so uh we'll we'll see i think you would actually like it too because it reminded me a lot of um uh phoenix right Ooh yeah you know and the fact that it's just like look man you're 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 there to do a couple of things but the playing the video game part is not the most important part. You are kind of reading a book mostly. Yeah. You know? Is it uh, is it voice acted at all or is it mostly reading? It is uh, it, it voice acted. Yeah. Okay. I uh, I just opened a new tab to leave myself a note. And uh, when you search for Star Trek Resurgence on DuckDuckGo, uh, one of the articles that it highlights has the title, Star Trek Resurgence is the best of 90s Trek with the worst of 90s gaming and that's <laughs> i think that's a very pithy editor approved summary of what you just said <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah um uh it is all voice acting and i will say the voice acting is good the visuals behind the voice acting are tragic but the voice acting itself is is good you know do you have a how, how much time do you think you've put into it so far like are you still like an hour in or like several uh, I'm i'm at least four hours in do, do you have a is there like one overarching we have to stop the borg style problem or is this more just like the continuing adventures of this crew it's it seems like that there is one we have to stop the Borg. it, it seems like the and, and the interesting thing is that it seems like the thing you have to do is negotiate like a trade dispute kind of a thing you know so like you are on a diplomatic mission like that's the thing that you're there to do you know now i don't know like where they're going to go with that but that's what's ambassador spock is there to like he's the ambassador and he's like but i need your help and here's what we need to do kind of a thing but it seems that that's and and again when i saw that i was like yeah man because it's not all fight the borg if it was fight the borg then this has bad controls and bad this and bad that but <laughs> it's not it, the engine actually, for fighting the borg and actually one of the other things that they have is because there's a lot of times when they say like hit r2 to do a thing and like there, there's a lot of quick time moments you can turn that off mm, nice yeah, yeah, so, so they're they're definitely saying like there will be some action things, maybe, but definitely story things. Like the the story things are the non negotiable, right? The right. the thinky again Star Trekky part, and then the other actiony things. Like if you can straight up disable them, then that's a that's a for yeah, people who care. Yeah, like because like literally at one point I I missed the thing and I I died and it said like Would you like to try again or would you like to try again in story mode where none of it matters? You know, and I'm like. I'm going to try again. I, I'm, I'm not frustrated with this yet, but I like that I can just stop this if I don't like it, you know? Yeah, that's a uh, I, I think that kind of thing gives me visual novel 
kind of vibes, right? Because it's mm-hmm. like, no, the point is to get through the story. Like the objective right. is there is a story and we wrote it and we would like you to hear it. And I'm yeah. like, as an old school JRPG player, like I'm totally fine with that. Like I don't need everything to be an open world, full freedom, you know, like, the, but I, what I hate is games that are clearly doing one the other is the one that's popular in marketing at that time. So they mm. pretend they're the other one. And it's like, no, just, yeah. just be what you are. When, and I think that this one is, is not only the, you know, it's, it's not the last of us in the sense that like, we are here to tell a story is I think it's, it's the last of us. If it, if it was a choose your own adventure, you know? Yeah. So like, yeah. That, that, they, that, uh, I, I guess some visual novels have that. You have some sway on the story style, but it's usually within like, Yes. boundaries you know so like you may walk closer to one side of the hall than the other but you're still in a hallway yeah i think that the way i look at it is it's like i think the only i, I agree with you where they where they say we're here to tell a story the only tweak i would make is we're here to tell five stories and you get to pick which one we're telling you know but it's yeah. like you know because i was just kind of as as the crew was like yeah we're on board with you and as the captain was like no i don't like this i'm like this could definitely lead to a mutiny like situation where the crew's behind me because the captain is making the captain is making decisions that are based off of his ego which is not good leadership you know um i feel that that in this story that they're telling that the captain was a good leader at one point and now recently some things have happened that have like shaken him and he's not handling it well but i have to deal with it because i'm second in command you know so so again like just just kind of kind of well made what's your uh I've got a, a a big discussion topic, but what's yours? Um, I just wanted to gush a little bit about the Steam Deck, honestly. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. Be, because so I I think I may have said this to you or said this on another episode, but the uh, I've had a Switch since pretty early on. I think maybe like the first year I got one, and mm-hmm. my hands are like they're big for my height, but I am short. Right. So (laughs) my hands are not huge on the scale of hands. And I find the switch uncomfortably small to hold Mm -hmm. in handheld mode. And that is like one of the main things I was excited to get out of it, because when I saw in the original like ads where you could literally pick it like the game is on your TV screen and you pick it up off the dock and just immediately continue what you were doing. I just I mean, because I work in technology, right? I've been in technology for my whole career and I just went. No, it can't be that fast. And it is. It is actually that fast. Like you could be playing a race of Mario Kart and pick the switch right up off the deck and or off the the little dock that it sits in. And the game just continues playing. And now it's on the small screen instead of your television. Like it's amazing. It's really, really cool. The problem is I can only play with it in that super cool, super portable mode for like 30 minutes. And then my hands are friggin' killing me. And they make custom like joy cons that you can put on that are more like big um kind of ergonomic handles but then you can't use a regular switch traveling case you have to use a special one or you have to take the handles off and carry them separately and it just it adds little additional wrinkles that are very frustrating right so i to the point where i was like okay i basically play this switch in two ways as a regular console with a pro controller sitting on my couch in which case none of that mobility stuff matters or if I am playing a game that is a Switch exclusive, so I have to play it on the Switch, and I, it, my only window to play it is when I'm going to be away from a TV, then I'm playing it, like, begrudgingly, and that's not great, right? Like, mm. I don't want to say, like, I hate reading this book because I just have <laughs> to get to the end of the book. So I was, I, my, my Switch, unfortunately, has been relegated to games i cannot play anywhere else like yep. i love a mario i love a zelda I lo- you know their nintendo I, I played the uh like metro dread when that came out and i loved it i loved it to death but like those games are as tethered to the wall for me personally as my ps5 or my gaming pc so i'm like losing all of the things that makes the switch the switch and that was very frustrating when the steam deck got announced i saw pictures of it and like um like renderings with measurements on it and like how much bigger it was. And I was like, this thing is massive. This is like stupidly massive. Who would want to carry this giant thing around? And then it was way on back order. Then slowly I started knowing people who had them and they were like, not as big as you think, man. And all that extra space is worth it because it's hollow inside. So it's not bigger and heavier. It's bigger Mm. for ergonomics, right? So that it, it sits in your palm. You're not like pinching it with your fingers. 
if I was a kid, a switch would sit in my palms, but I'm not. So I'm like pinching it with my, my fingers and my thumbs. And I was just like, oh, yeah. I don't, okay. So these are people like I trust because they play a lot of games and they play a lot of games on the go. So like if they're saying the ergonomics are good, like that, that sounds kind of good. And then uh, I found out that it came into like normal rotation where it just anybody could just order it whenever and they would ship it within like a week or two. And, and it was not on like months of delay back order. Right. Cause the thing was originally announced, like I think in the last six months of COVID lockdown. So like all the supply chain stuff was all messed up. Right. Right. And so I finally was complaining. I was like, man, you know, I just like I have PC games. I have, you know, classic games, I have games I want to play that I can't, get to because i'm just not always in a place where i can sit down in front of my monitor or in front of the television and pick up a controller that is plugged into a console and like have that i want that experience it's just not my life right now and so for like two days i was just like oh maybe because like i have there's this program i do where i can like earn gift cards and so maybe like i'll i'll save up that gift card money and then I was like, oh, may- maybe I already have like a few dollars in there. And I went and looked and because I hadn't messed with it in a while, I already had like three quarters of the money I needed to, <laughs> to pay for it because it's just been building up over like months and months and months. I was like, ah, OK, you know, whatever. I'm just I'm just okay. going to do it. I'm just going to buy it right now. So so I ordered it. Um, it comes with a traveling case, which is nice because it's perfectly fit for it and everything. It's got the ergonomics are exactly what I was hoping they would be. It feels great in my hand. I can play it for. I haven't been able to play for more than like an hour, hour and a half, but like I could, right. I could play for that long. And then when I put it down, my hands are not friggin' aching from pinching <laughs> in like a weird claw grip thing. And it's, I think it's a seven inch screen or an eight inch screen. It's, it's bigger than the switch. Um, but it's a really nice screen and you're holding it in your hands. So like final fantasy 14, which is an incredibly UI dense, it's an MMO, right? There's a million billion things on the screen. I can play that game on the switch deck. It runs serviceably well. I can see what I need to see to like play the game. Um, I played uh, all the games actually that I talked about. I played all of those on the switch deck over the last, I think week and a half since we recorded. Um, it's just really nice to be able to say I have 20 minutes like, and I'm not ignoring something else, right? It's not like my, my child is taking their first steps right next to me. And I'm like, haha, but I have a steam deck, right? It's like, I, uh, my, I had to take my kid to a swimming lesson last week. It's like, I'm just sitting in the lobby while they're in like an enclosed room in the little like wave pool thing. So like, I can't help. I'm not involved. Like I have nothing to do. I would just be on my phone or reading a book or something, but I have a steam deck. So I, I got to play video games for 30 minutes. It was great. I loved it. Like, <laughs> it's like, this is, I'm now <laughs> getting the joy that I didn't get as a kid. Cause I didn't have a game boy where it's like, I'm away from my super Nintendo, but I can still play Mario, right? Like this is that exact kind of vibe. And the nice side effect for me is normally when you get a new console, it's like, Oh, well I just got a PS five switch or an Xbox or whatever. Now I have to buy games for it. But because this thing is just a little PC, I have a lot of games that can be played on PC, literally hundreds and hundreds of them because I religiously get the free games that like steam and Epic give away every week. Um, I bought humble bundles and stuff over the years. So, I mean, I have, I now like just by sheer volume, having to adopt your position of, I need to be indifferent to my backlog because now that I actually have access to my backlog, I can't, I'm never going to tackle it. Like <laughs> just way too massive, but, but it's nice. Cause like, several of the games that I played over the last couple of weeks, I would, I would never block out time to sit down and play those games. But now that I can play them for 10 or 15 minutes, when I actually have that 10 or 15 minutes and then decide, do I want to continue to invest in this? Like, this is exactly what I want. This is, this is slotting in. Like I, I, I saw, you know, a, a hole and I had like a piece that I thought I was like, I think this will just about fit in there. And it's like a perfect snug fit. Like the whole thing is papered over and it looks like there was never any damage there. Like my video game life is repaired. So how does it handle? Cause it, it is, it's like a video game console, but it's made for games that are for the computer. Yes. Yes. Okay. So like, how does it handle the fact that it's, you're not using WASD and all that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is where I actually learned some fascinating things about how PC video games work that I did not know before. Cause I just never had a reason to like dig into it. So uh steam part of the benefit of 
buying games through Steam is that Steam takes some of the things you do and puts them in a database somewhere so that when someone else tries to do the thing you're doing, they already have data for that. So what I mean by that is if you sit down at your PC and somehow you were the first person to ever plug your PS5 in because it's a USB-C controller. So you plug the, the PS5 controller into your PC and it says, hey, we don't know what the hell that thing is. Where are the buttons? And you say, oh, well, here's the D-pad and here are the thumbsticks and here's the shoulder buttons. Now, next week, when I plug my PS5 controller in, it goes, oh, hey, here's the buttons. Go ahead and just start playing your game. Have a good time. Right. And like, so because this has um, like a compatibility layer, there are like most modern PC games expect you to play with a controller because modern PCs have had controller support for a while. Um officially and unofficially through certain channels but like it's 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 been normal for a long time um so not only can you play with the the built-in controls but like i could pair my ps5 controller to the steam deck and and sit it on the table and then play with it separately or uh you can actually it has a little dock like the switch so you can use an external monitor and a keyboard and mouse and stuff if you want to um they've done some clever things where like on the front of it under the thumbsticks there are these two little black squares and those are actually virtual mice so if mm. you need to like pick something from a menu and for whatever reason that menu doesn't respond to like the D-pad, you can actually run your thumb and it will move a cursor on screen and then you hit one of the shoulder buttons to do left click and the other shoulder button to do right click. So uh, there's a like a key combination that'll bring up a little on screen keyboard so you can enter text when you have to. So most like I said, most games are going to support controllers because controller support has been an expectation for a long time. but. Even for the ones that are just like, no, you have to use a keyboard and mouse. It will still work with an external keyboard and mouse, and it has the virtual internal keyboard and mouse. So it's incredibly well thought out. Um, and so follow-up question. Like, let's say that you wanted to loan me your Steam Deck, and I wanted to play, like, a game I owned on it. I assume it supports that pretty well? <sighs> That's a good question. I actually don't know how it handles multi-user. My guess would be it handles it fine. And the only reason I would assume that is because Steam, like on a PC, like if you just install Steam on Windows, that handles multiple users really well. So uh, kind of like on a, a PlayStation, like I can log into your PlayStation and then you can borrow right. games from my library. Steam basically has that exact same model. In fact, they I think they probably had it first. Um, so you can log into a free, like actually my friend's steam account is logged in on my pc and i'm logged in on hers so like i have access to her game she has access to my games right um so i i assume it would probably work fine where i could say like oh just log like here it is log into it with your steam account and then you'll be able to see all of my games and all of your games so here's what we're gonna do um when you come to visit me you're gonna bring that and i am going to regardless of whether or not i purchase a steam deck buy darkest dungeon 2 <laughs> and we're gonna see how well this works on your steam deck <laughs> <laughs> D done i cannot right. wait to report back on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then and then and then after you go we'll we'll, we'll report back on on the episode yes. yeah yeah. That, that's where all of those those leading questions were, were going <laughs> yeah <laughs> were you, there's a uh in like product management there's this uh theory of like jobs to be done where it's like mm -hmm. oh nobody buys nails because they want to put holes in the wall they buy a hammer and nails because they want to like hang a picture of their their grandchildren right so mm -hmm. the job to be done of a hammer is hang a picture of my grandchild right mm -hmm. and so like you were just doing a jobs to be done interview for darkest dungeon like, <laughs> like yeah will, i want to know this if this tool, will play darkest yeah will yeah. this tool allow me to play darkest dungeon 2 if not then this is not the right tool for the job Right. Well, and that, cause that's the thing is that like there are a bunch of games like where somebody will say like, oh, you should check this out or oh, try this. And I'm like, OK, cool. Oh, it's your PC only. And I do have a PC, a gaming PC that would play that. But that's not what I use it for. You know, so I'm like, oh, man, I got to go. And, and, and it just seems so dumb. But it's like I got to go upstairs, unplug the thing, bring it downstairs, plug the controller in, get it all set up, you know, and, and that whole process takes like five or ten minutes. But I can literally pick up my PlayStation remote, press, press the PlayStation button, and I'm playing video games right now, you know? And so it's it just that extra little threshold is just, it's a lot sometimes, you know? So, like, yeah. if if I had the Steam Deck downstairs, especially if it if I can, you know, pair the PS, you know, whatever remote to it and plug it into the the TV so I could say, like, okay, this controller is the Steam Deck controller. And then, like, when I want to play 
Darkest Dungeon 2, I just pick up a different controller and now I'm playing it, I'm way more likely to play those games. Um, so yeah, no, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah, I'm no, dude, the, exciting. You, for some people, I would say one of the drawbacks to it is it is not a super powerful PC. So if you want to play, you know, Call of Bro Duty 15 on 4K settings at 120 frames per second, this is not the machine for that, right? It's not going to render photorealistic people at super high frame rates where there's a million billion particle effects on screen because that's not what it's for. Right. right. If you want to play that game, you sit down at your PS5 or your powerful gaming PC or whatever. But, you know, both of us, I think, are in similar positions where it's like we have a whole life of things going on. So a lot of times we don't get around to games when they're brand ass new. Right. So by the t- like most of the games I'm playing at one point were physically demand or physically demand, physically demanding <laughs> on yeah. the on the hardware. Right. Like Final Fantasy 14 10 years ago. I'm sure was required a fairly powerful PC. The game is 10 years old now and they've done like graphical improvements and stuff. So it is a little bit beefier than it, it was in 2013, but it, the, I mean, the steam deck runs it. No sweat, like no, no big deal. Right. And then if you sit down and you're like, Oh, I want to play and you pick up a PS five controller that's paired to it all the time. That's like the default, you know, paired controller for the, the steam deck. And then your kids are like, hey, we want to come and sit with that on the couch in color while he's playing. And you're like, yeah, I don't want them watching this. You just pick the Steam Deck off, off the dock and just play it in handheld mode. And then your kids can sit there in color. And it's like, OK, now mom can watch TV and the kids can color and you can just keep doing what you're doing. And like it's it, it's it's not perfect, right? No piece of hardware is perfect. But for like I said, for the hole in my life that it needed to fill, the fit is just so good. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the thing is that there's a because I, I thought about a Steam Deck again for a number of different things, but like I was just I, I was like, yeah, there's nothing that I'm like really Jones in the play on the computer. There's some stuff where occasionally they're like, hey, you should play this. I'm like, oh, I would, uh, you know, whatever. I'll see if it comes out on the PlayStation. But Darkest Dungeon 2, I'm like, <laughs> w- when is that coming to the PlayStation? Because I need it. Yeah. And uh, especially because unfortunately, um, you know, the, an article popped up on my thing and said like, Hey, uh, darkest dungeon two. And I was like for the PlayStation and I scrolled through and it was like, no, not for the PlayStation. So then I Googled, Hey, PlayStation, when are you going to get this? And they're like, yeah, we don't really know. And I was like, okay, that's cool. But now my feet is like, what do you think the three best feats are for this thing? And what do you think this? And, and I'm like, I want, I want to play it. Okay. Like I, like I'm <laughs> with you. Take it, my money. It, it just, just put it on the PlayStation. Um, but if this does that, then, you know, for whatever, was it like five hundred dollars, something like that? Uh, the there's three models. The base model I would not recommend. The middle model is six, or uh, yeah. no, it's five five forty nine, five forty nine. Yeah. So I mean, like again, it's 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 a PlayStation, right? So, yeah. So that's a substantial a substantial chunk of money, but one where I could say like, it's my birthday, you know, like or, or whatever, you yeah. know, like this is a thing that I want. Um, I, I do yeah. have one other thing I will mention about it, just just a casual thing i want to just say is it it is a fact right i don't want to make a big deal out of it but i i've been told uh by terrible people who are bad and do bad things with the internet that it is also an incredibly powerful emulation machine uh up to and including even fairly recent consoles so if you're a mm. bad person who would do something like buy a video game legitimately and then back it up because God damn it, you own it and you're allowed to do things like that. And I don't care what the law says. Um, this could theoretically facilitate those kinds of behaviors that I wouldn't encourage, but have no. absolutely participated in and strongly encourage. So, yeah. you know, so that's a thing so that too. being said is, is if, if we, if I were to emulate it and then hypothetically, let's say I wanted to talk about it, but with a friend, but in a forum where other people could hear us talk about it. Right. Right. I could use that to then gain information that I could then use to have an educated discussion that we could then like record. Yes. And and again, put strictly in theory, we've never tested this. No, absolutely not. No gog.com. So (laughs) (laughs) no gog.show. Okay. Sorry. Um, So the question that I had, is this is for video games and for movies um but you know we can focus you, it on video you can games. watch movies on steam deck oh yeah, sorry are we on to something different now oh <laughs> yeah, what, what, what are we doing <laughs> oh my god i'm i'm alive and i'm doing a podcast it seems like uh so um is so 
a lot of a lot of media nowadays, video games as well, th- that are narratively driven, uh, seem to like be focused on oh, well, what's the twist? You know, like what's the big surprise, right? And so the reason why I, I'm asking this is is, is 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 it seems like if somebody says oh, well that that plot was predictable, and it's like okay, is that inherently bad that you were able to predict the plot? But the reason why I ask is because what I literally kind of what I said earlier is when I said, it seems like the crew is really liking what I'm laying down and it seems like the captain's really hating what I'm laying down. So is this going to come to a head where like the crew is like where like the captain throws me in the brig or whatever. And then the crew's like, no, man, we need you to leave because you're not going to get us all killed. Right. So if that were to happen, I thought about it. and I was like, if that were to happen, I would be like, oh, I saw that coming, but I wouldn't be upset or frustrated or disappointed because I'm excited to see how they get there and how it resolves, right? But I feel like a lot of people would be like, oh, well, that was predictable. I could tell from the, the, from the start that there was going to be a mutiny, right? So is, is it bad to be predictable? Yeah, I think there is, there's some interesting facets to this. One is, I think there's a confirmation bias of the kind of person who complains that something was predictable is just more likely to you're more likely to encounter them than someone who's just like oh i thought that had a good story i enjoyed it right so if you watch something that's like a super bog standard hero's journey right thousands of years old concept um most people would not remark on like oh it was a bog standard hero's journey and i love those because that's just such a part of how humans tell stories that mm-hmm. it is not even worth remarking on except for the smart asses who have to be like oh, i'm so much i i don't even own a tv i don't even listen to popular <laughs> music right it's, it's that kind of and and because a lot of movies and games and and you know popular novels have big twists and sell themselves on like you'll never see it coming or like the the ending will blow your mind or it's it's essentially a it's it it came first but it is the same sort of mentality as clickbait right like you know th- these five celebr you won't believe what these five celebrities look like now number 3 will shock you and it's like <laughs> oh man i, I got to know and then you get in there and one of two things happens either you are shocked and they had the effect they wanted or you guessed which celebrity was going to look terrible and then you either feel good about that or you don't but in any of those three outcomes they don't care because they got you to click on the article right and so when the fact that like buying the movie or buying the game or clicking on the article is what those people are after, not necessarily satisfaction guaranteed, right? Then that group of I'm going to go online and complain about this is not only not a risk to them because they don't care, but it's kind of benefit because then other people are like, wow, a lot of people are talking about how the twist in the new Super Mario universe game was not as crazy as they expected. I should go buy that game and see if it's really as mediocre as people are saying. And it's like, what? Now you're just coming up with insane reasons to justify the thing you wanted to do anyway. You want to, you want to prove the haters wrong. You want to prove the haters right. You want to like, just, I don't know, just do the thing. But I, I think that's a big part of it is that there's the, the outsized number of people you hear from are the whiny people complaining. The The other side to it to me is uh, they have done some studies on whether or not spoilers ruin things for people and not overwhelming, un, like irrefutable evidence, but the evidence seems to be porting towards spoilers actually make you enjoy things more because when you are not obsessively trying to think ahead, you can go full George is the Buddha and just live in the moment. <laughs> And people are happier when they're living in the moment, right? That's why we have Nirvana. It's like a yes. thing that people would aspire to. So knowing that there's a twist and even knowing what the twist is means you're free to stop worrying about what the goddamn twist is. So I don't think, you you know, it's good to just go around and, and ruin things for people. But to say that things that are predictable are bad is like kind of scientifically proven to be false. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I think that because, you know, there have actually been uh, areas, games, movies, things like that, where I've actually disengaged because I felt that the twist was going to be predictable, you know, where it's like, oh, they're setting up this thing and and 
and it's like, oh, but what's go- what's in this black box? What's the mystery? And I'm like, it, this is what's in the black box. And I think that that to me, so I agree with you. And I think that to me, the the problem then is then it's fine if what's in the black box is like. When it pops out of the black box, you're like, whoa, I had no idea that's what it was. Or if what's in the black box pops out and you're like, ah, I knew what that was. But if all the, the the entertainment has going for it is, look, there's a thing in this black box, then you're you're really then, then you're really banking on whatever pops out of that black box is a surprise, right? You know, like the sixth sense, fine movie, but like if not for the I see dead people, like that part, like that twist at the end, most of that movie is unremarkable. You know, like, so that's the thing is that, but what was in the, bo- in, in the black box was really exciting and really cool. So it's worth the one and a half hour lead in to this like five minute payoff. Right. And so I don't think that it's about what happens, but again, like if, if you don't, it's okay for to make things predictable, but now you have to like make the movie itself enjoyable, the video itself, video game itself enjoyable, right? So the reason why I was like, I bet, I bet this could lead to a mutiny situation, but that didn't bother me is because I'm like, I have no idea how they're going to get there or who's going to be involved or what characters are going to be on board or not on board or like what's going to force this situation. Like all of these are questions that I want answered, right? So even though I may, and, and again, I may be wrong, right? Even though I may have sussed out like, one of the story notes i'm still interested in all of the notes to lead up to it and all of the notes that come afterwards as opposed to i have created a stereotypical desaturated steampunk universe where everything is exactly the way you would anticipate it being and the other thing that i think is important is one of the things that could make something predictable is if characters are behaving predictably and i thought about that and i'm like well i'm not sure that that's inherently a bad thing because Characters that behave unpredictably, unless like that is part of their character, is crappy writing, right? right? Like, <laughs> like we've known each other for a while. You should be able to say like, well, if A, George is going to do B, you know, like literally I just had this with a friend of mine recently where um, somebody said, I don't know why George is trying to do this thing. He's like, George is trying to do thing A. And he relayed this conversation to me. I'm like, that is exactly what I'm trying to do. Yes. And he goes like, yeah. So you see, like that's so again, like, but I think the question is where it becomes problematic is not when characters behave predictably is when they behave stereotypically when they become a caricature of themselves then it becomes tiresome right when it's just like you know so for instance if you know joey you know when he from friends right if he's put into a situation and it's like oh well you know knowing everything i know about joey he's probably going to you know go into the situation and uh and, you know, be upset that his friends, you know, were like behaving poorly and that other people were behaving poorly to them because he's like kind of the heart of the group. So he is going to fo- focus on the emotional aspect of it, whereas Ross, predictably, would focus on like the intellectual aspect of it. And there, therein will lie conflict and resolution. But when Joey walks in and goes like, I'm hungry, I want to eat. And it's like, OK, well, fine. Yes, that is the caricature part of that character you're you're now a series of catchphrases right so i think that that's when that becomes tiresome but i think that people a lot of times conflate the two where it's like well this character is just so predictable and it's like that's fine if you know you know that tuvok the vulcan is going to do you know very logical vulcan stuff but when like he behaves exactly the way that he did you know where, where you're like he is going to not care about any of this other stuff he's going to do nothing surprising because he's going to act stereotypically, you know, it's fine yeah. for him to say for you to say, like, given this situation and the fact that Tuvok is like a person, I give like a 75 percent chance that he's going to do thing A, but a 25 percent chance he could do B, thing B because all people are unpredictable. But when it's like Tuvok behaves in this way, 100 percent all the time, every time, because he's two dimensional. That's the problem, you know. Yeah. Well, and to keep this on Star Trek, because we talked about Star Trek game. Um, yep. The I've been watching through Star Trek Discovery. I think we talked about it mm. briefly. Um, and it's not good. It's a bad show. But <laughs> but what has kept me watching it is that all of the actors are good. Some of the actors are phenomenal. And some of the interactions between certain actors are really phenomenal. So even though the scenario they're in is contrived and ridiculous, and like how they got to where they are and what they're trying to accomplish is often contrived and ridiculous. Some of the like one on one interactions or like, you know, small group interactions are just so good and they're so well performed that I'm like, 
I don't actually care about them accomplishing any of their goals. <laughs> but like, I just want her to be happy because she seems like a really good person and she's really trying her best. Right. And nice. so, so like you end up in this weird position where I'm not, I'm definitely not hate watching it, but if somebody said like, Oh, should I watch star Trek discovery? I'd be like, do you care about the individual character relationships? Which is why my wife loves it. Cause that's what she cares about. Right. Or do you care about like the, the threat to the universe or the threat to the Federation, right? The large scale problem they're dealing with. And if they said large scale problem they're dealing with, I'd be like, no, it's terrible. It involves time travel. It's garbage. Like it's, <laughs> it's just not, I personally like by the things that I, I rank like a good story on, like the, the episode we just watched, they had to have like a Vulcan debate club thing. And I was like, Oh, okay. So uh, the main character, Michael wants to get something from the Vulcans and they're like, no. And she invokes the right to Vulcan debate club. And then they're very angry about that because like they have to, you know, it's an ancient tradition that they still uphold. So they have to honor it, but they understand what she's doing. And I was like, oh, this is interesting because she's human, but she was raised on Vulcan. So she has like some Vulcan tendencies, like kind of a Spock, like, you know, that split between worlds character. Yep. And then the it ends up being a debate between her and the tribunal because she has to convince the whole like quorum but everyone on the ship is in attendance and nice. so there's like an audience to this ancient ritual debate club that they know nothing about and like she has an advocate but the advocate like openly undermines her in a bid to get her to have an emotional appeal so that she can guarantee that she's speaking honestly, which I don't think Vulcans would find valuable. Like it's <laughs> the whole thing is completely contrived. But after all of that, at the end, the main character and her advocate who she has a prior relationship with, they have a conversation that is incredibly genuine and very moving and very well performed. And I was like, we had to sit through 40 minutes of insane bullshit. <laughs> to get to this like <laughs> 90 second scene that was incredibly satisfying. And that's not an easy to recommend ratio, right? Cause right. like that's, there was all this to, to do exactly what I think you're saying to avoid predictability. They were like, well then there's this crazy thing. And then this character is going to do something no one expected. And it's like, of course it was unexpected. We didn't know anything about this ritual until the beginning of this episode. And you didn't explain anything. You've been explaining it in flight. So saying, whoa, there's a rule you didn't even know about is like, I didn't know about any of the rules. Like, right. <laughs> none of this is is familiar. When I think that that then, you know, uh, that so two things. One is that uh, I, I agree that sometimes, uh, you know, character performances can can be, a, uh, you know, like a driver for it. One of the things that I always felt that Voyager kind of left, lost out on was uh, Jerry Ryan is a fantastic actress, right? And they brought her on to play Seven of Nine and then never did anything really with that character as far as character development to allow her to, you know, be a good actress. So she just had to be like, I am Seven of Nine and I am Borg and I am Data, right? You know, yeah. that's but why then, they like, probably bought her back in Picard so she could yeah. actually like act. Yeah. But then I remember because I was just kind of like, ah, oh, fine. It's Jerry Ryan. They brought her on, you know, ratings, whatever. Right. But then I was watching it and there's one episode where the doctor downloads himself like into her you know borg stuff right so she is now the doctor in her body and that was the doctor that was the hollow doctor jerry ryan is playing him but i was like that that was perfect i am so impressed by how much i'm like that is a that is a 57 year old man in this 28 year old woman's body you know i was like Tens across the board. Why aren't you letting her do this more? You know, like <laughs> you got her walking around. You know, I mean, it's, it, it'd be like having Wolfgang Puck making, you know, like hard boiled eggs. It's like, what are you doing, <laughs> man? Like, you, let, let, let this Ferrari out of the garage. Um, I say all that to say, uh, uh, I think that where I could probably wrap this back to is, um, is a lot of the times is, is the story based off of like an extrinsic reward or an intrinsic reward, which is to say like, is the entire narrative based off of the extrinsic reward of, I want to find out what's in the box, right? So I'm willing to put up with all of this other BS and nonsense because I want to know what's in the box. I want to know what the monster looks like. I want to know whatever, right? Or is the story genuinely moment to moment enjoyable, you know? And I think it's more difficult to make the moment. It's, it's easy to say like, 
I came up with a cool thing that I put in a box. Don't you want to know what it is? Doesn't matter what I do for two hours as long as there's something cool in the box. And that's that's just a gamble, right? It's lost. It's one, you, you just one described of, lost. Yes, right? <laughs> one roll of the dice, right? Like you'll either like what's in the box or you won't, you know? Whereas opposed to like The Last of Us, right? Where the thing in the box, the big reveal was that like, oh, this thing will kill Ellie. But like, that's not what the story's about, you know? Like the story's about their relationship. And that thing being in the box is just like, the final struggle right you know like there's a bunch of different struggles and this is just the last test right so if all if, if that wasn't a thing right the story would still be amazing right so um yeah so the moral of the story is that video games and movies are better if they're intrinsically rewarding the curtain falls the music plays the credits roll then it all fades black and you're left by yourself the fanfare is gone there's no player two there by your side to share victories won but as you slowly progress down the hall to your bed a few great events leak back into your head from the time that you spent Traversing the land Battling evil Fighting the darkness Just sword in hand Your memories creep in With the edge of a smile You realize again What you lost for a while You gotta think back much less On how you saved the day Then on all Along for the ride.